Uh, my name is Tomek. Uh, if you listened to my talk yesterday, you know that you already know that I am uh, bad at estimating. But let me give you three more facts about me. I am from Poland, from a beautiful city of Kraków. We have a real castle with a real dragon. <laughs> uh, and we have a great Ruby community, just as you, are, just as you have. Uh, fact number two, I work at Lunar Logic. We are a small rails shop. Uh, actually, we are the oldest rails shop in Poland. And we do some cool things. Uh, for instance, we are what we call extreme self-managed organization, which means that like, I have no boss, I, we have no managers. We make all decisions collectively, including decisions about salaries, for example. But that's a different story. And fact number three, I am an object-oriented Ruby programmer, which I guess is not really surprising, right? So let me put it differently. I like to think that I am an object-oriented programmer thanks to Ruby. And that's because Ruby is a very dense and very low ceremony language. It's optimized for our happiness, but it's also optimized for our productivity, which uh, makes it a perfect playground for experimenting and learning not only you know, the syntax, but also broader programming concepts. Uh, we have a great community. We have great resources. And that makes you move quickly and uh, learn not only the, the how, but also the why of object-oriented principles, design patterns, and refactoring techniques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in a, in a sense, I, I think Ruby is a great enabler. So it was two years ago when I was uh, at this moment when I just kind of started the I'm, I'm starting to get this OO thing, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grasping this, this stuff. And then suddenly everyone started talking about functional programming. You know, my, my senior uh, friends at Lunar started doing closure and hype around stuff like Elixir and Phoenix and Scala kind of took on, or reached me at least. Uh, suddenly, you know, functional is the new black. And I'm like, Come on, <laughs> come on, I just, I just learned this OO thing here, you know? Like, give me a break, I wanna, I wanna you know, get better at this. I, now we're telling me there's something different, something better, I should switch. Uh, but of course, you know, it's programming, so I know that you have to keep learning and to stay afloat, and there's always something, right? So I did my research, it wasn't really encouraging, right? So despite knowing that you know, at some point I probably have to you know, dig into this stuff, I, I decided not to invest too much time at that, at that moment uh, and, and, and stay focused on, on perfecting my OO skills. But you know what they say, if all you have is a hammer, then all your problems look the same, right? You approach problems from the same perspective. So I want to share a story today about the project which didn't play really nice when we applied our object-oriented hammer to it. Let me start with some business context. Imagine we are building a Rails app, which is essentially, essentially a, a mortgage broker, an online mortgage broker. So it works like this. You have a user, you log in, you fill in this huge multi-step form with lots of data about your property, about your financials, about uh, your family and whatnot. Just a big confession, basically. Then the system will run this data through different banks and present you with a list of offers. A mortgage offers, a comparison, you can choose one of them and go close the deal with the bank. Um, now, the important thing is that we don't use any bank APIs to send the data. We have to crunch all the numbers within the app. That's like, the that's specific, specific thing of the, of the market for which this was, uh, this was uh, done. So we need to get, we need to get these offers as real, as exact, as, as good as possible. So we have to calculate something that's called a credit score, which is like a grade that every bank gives you and everything down the road is based on that grade. Uh, and of course, we, we don't know how to do it, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's banking, so it's uh, difficult stuff. We are given a general formula from our client, 
uh, which is just like a long list of, uh, of calculations, of uh, transformations of data we have to do in order to calculate the score. It's like a general algorithm. We are told that it's going to work for every bank. We're just going to kind of plug in different data parameters to that, and it's going to work. So let's try putting that into code. Let's, let's come up with a really simple procedural style implementation. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to use simple letters instead of uh, hardcore banking words like you know amortization, collaterals, etc. We're just going to use simple, uh, simple letters for that. So first one is just a simple addition of two data points from the property model. Another one is, uh, is similar. Another one which reuses some of the previous values. Uh, there were some conditional. There was some conditional logic also uh, in, in some of those calculations, and so on, so on. We arrive at our final score, which we can which we can return. If we were to put it in a graphical form, this would look more or less like this. Each of the green thing is is just like one calculation, right? Uh, so, of course, our method cannot just float around. We have to wrap it in some kind of a class. Let's call it score calculator. And uh, we need to pass in all our collaborating objects or our data holders through the constructor. So our score method can operate on them. And there's a lot of those objects, uh, which is not really nice when you're, doing, uh, when you're trying to do a good OO. Um, so, first thing we notice about, let's, let's try refactoring this a bit, right? Think, think, first thing we see is that the score method is really long. We don't like long methods, it's a code smell. So why don't we pull out every, each of those uh, calculations into private methods and, uh, um, you know, make it more modular a bit. Now, while doing this, we notice that some of these methods are actually very feature envy, which means they operate on one particular model so we can actually pull it out and put it on a borrower model or a decorator or get generally pull it out from the, from the calculation. And of course, we reduce the, the instance, variable, instance variables here and we call that method from our calculator like this. It's, it's a general OO, good practice that you know, behavior follows the data, right? So after this little refactoring, our architecture looks like this, right? We have just one big class. But this class is huge, right? It's definitely longer than 100, of 100 lines. And, you know, Sandy Matt says shouldn't be longer than 100 lines. So let's split it up. Let's make it, let's, let's split it up into, into more focused, more cohesive, more single responsibility uh, classes. For example, we can extract an investiture calculator which operates on a subset of those models, and we just pull out uh, some methods from our score calculator. So as a result, we end up with something like this, right? We have, we have a set of focused objects with uh, more cohesive uh, code working around smaller subset of those models, and our score calculator becomes, becomes uh, a sort of uh, like a coordinator just delegating work. And this design is, is, is quite okay, I guess, right? So we put it into production and the product goes live and first customers start coming in. At first we had really just two banks, so it you know, wasn't really a big comparison, but it was something. And then new features start coming in. First thing we have to do is to implement a bank report, like a, like a presentation, like a summary of what we did to the data. So now we not only need our, our score, but we also need all the meet results uh, calculations we performed. So we have to pull up our, old, our you know, private, private parts of our classes back to the public section. Or at least this is what we did. There's probably maybe a better way, but you know we don't really have time. Uh, we don't really have time to ponder and to think uh, uh, how to do it better because new banks are coming to the platform. Our client uh, uh, signs new deals with the banks, and we have to start adding them uh, uh, to the system. Well, that's going to be easy, right? We have this general algorithm, general formula. 
All we have to do is just add another row to the banks table, right, with just a new set of parameters. Should be simple, should just work out of the box. Well, it doesn't, actually. It turns out that banks want to do things differently here and there. If you remember our total income method we had on the borrower model, well, a new bank comes in and says, I want to divide your bonus income by two. So uh, we have to pull it back and introduce another parameter, right, to the, to the, ba to the bank uh, class, to the bank model, which is not that bad, I guess. It's just, it's just a colon in the database, right? But if you think about it, we have to also introduce the same parameter for all of the previous banks, which doesn't really make sense in the context of their domain. Like, they don't have this bonus factor, right? But anyway, we do it. It's the simplest thing we can do. And, you know, let's just move on with this, right? Some of those changes, however, to the calculations were, were much more significant. The banks wanted to calculate things completely different. Like, they actually wanted to use different formulas, or they introduced new formulas. The object-oriented answer to this kind of thing is a strategy pattern, which lets you inject behavior dynamically into your uh, main algorithm uh, and call it polymorphically, and this is based on some external context. In our case, this context was obviously the different banks. So a new bank comes in, and it has three new strategies. We will just implement them as single method objects, and we will, we will just inject them into our flow. Sometimes we were actually uh, replacing the entire, the entire calculators. An example of this would be amortization strategy, right? We have to do, of course, since we are now bringing those strategies, we have to spin off default strategies, right, for all the old banks. And also, there's a little problem that some of those strategies work on different collaborating objects, right? So we have to pass them, actually we have to pass, you know, the, the bigger subset of them, right? Because we, you know, the caller, the calling code doesn't know which strategy it's calling, so we have to pass more objects than it, that, that, it, that we need, right? Which makes us think that, uh, that it's like we should probably be passing everything everywhere. So those new banks keep coming, and we are spinning those strategies, and every bank brings some new stuff, and at some point, we are just drowning with this code. Those strategies start to have their own strategies, and it's a mess. It's, it's, it becomes a pain to work with. It's, it's become really unmaintainable. The, there's, like, you look at this code, and I don't see an intent of it anymore. Can you feel this pain? Can you feel this pain a bit at least? I, it's hard to convey on a few slides. You just have to take my word for, word for it. Uh, I can add that we not only had the bank context, like vertical context, but we also had kind of use cases, like purchase, refinance, inheritance kind of stuff. So we also had horizontal contexts, which make like a matrix of those strategies. It was just, it was just painful. It was just really painful to work with that. Definitely not fun. We were slowed down to a crawl. Adding new bank to the platform just took, you know, two weeks, for example. Uh, we were demotivated. We, it was difficult to introduce uh, new developers to the project. And we had a really low bus factor. Uh, bus factor is, is, uh, is the smallest number of developers in a project, such that if all of them got hit by the bus, your project is in trouble. <laughs> and in our case, it was, it was one. It was, it was just me. At some point, I was the only one capable of, of, of uh, adding new bank to the platform. And you, know, you, might feel, you might think that this is like you know, being irreplace, irreplaceable, but it actually was really frustrating because I, I felt like I'm going to be stuck with this, with this crappy design forever, right? 
which I did myself. <laughs> so if you look at this list again, these are classical, classical symptoms of low code quality and a, and a strong indication that you need, to, you need to do something about it. You need to refactor or rewrite your code. You, just, you cannot just move on like this. So we decided to do it. We decided to take a step back and try to do something about it. But, but how do we do it? Like, we, we didn't really have an answer to that. We tried, we tried experimenting a bit, spiking some solutions, uh, uh, researching some other design patterns. I even tried doing some TDD. Uh, I didn't know at that time that it's not a good practice, after, you know, today. <laughs> No, I actually tried hard to do it. I, to do it, I don't. I, I I think I might have been just too biased with with the previous solution. I, I just had too much knowledge about this stuff. It was difficult. I I needed a different perspective, a different, a fresh look at things. So let's let's do this. Let's think about our 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 models first. Now, we are using objects models here because it's a Rails app, right? And models are great abstractions of uh, great abstraction of of database records, right? And they, uh, they're great for collecting the data from the forms. But in the context of our calculation, they are actually not so useful. Uh, the, whole, the whole power of object-oriented, uh, of objects in, in OO comes from, from data hiding, from, from encapsulation, right? That we can hide our data and expose clear, uh, clean, small APIs. We cannot really do that here because we just need the data, right? So why don't we just release this data? Why don't we just convert it to some kind of a flat structure? Let's, I don't know, let's build a facade, for example. Or even simpler, let's just, let's just convert it to the, to the simple hash, right? Now, if you look closely at this hash, those objects are really still there, semantically, right? They just don't interfere. Uh, we don't have to pass them around. And we can do, of course, the same with our banks. And uh, since we have uh, you know, many different banks, let's just, for simplicity of this example, let's just hard code those parameters. Of course, in a real, uh, in a real application, we would use some kind, of a con some kind of a converting mechanism for that. So, okay, that's data. But what do we do with this? Now, if we revise what we've already been doing, it's, it was like this. First, we had those those, those calculations on one big method, like procedural style. Then we started pulling them out for, uh, to um, private methods, and then most of them ended up as single methods on, on their respective strategy objects, right? You see a pattern here. With every iteration, we've been giving them a bit more freedom. So why don't we, why don't we free them completely? Why don't we make them first-class citizens? Why don't we make them first-class functions? If you think about this, this is what they really are. They are just transformations of data, inputs, outputs. There's no state. We don't need the object boilerplate to pass them around, right? Yeah, first-class citizens. So how do we do first-class functions in Ruby? Well, there are a few ways. There are prox objects, there are method objects. The best one probably are lambdas. So let's do it with lambdas, right? We will just have a simple lambda taking our data hash in, taking whatever keys it needs, doing, the, doing its thing and return it, right? And then we can call it, uh, we can also use the, the, the Ruby shortcut syntax without the method name. The problem with lambdas is though they are equivalent of anonymous functions, right? And then they don't have a, they don't have a name. And we, in those calculations, in our case, are all meaningful domain concepts like amortization, collaterals, etc. So let's do a little trick here. Let's, let's use a module with a static method. Well, of course, technically it's not a, it's not a, it's not a first class function, but it has the same API as Lambda, right? You just call it, it's a callable. And it has, it, it, the implementation is exactly the same. One cool thing we can do with this stuff, with this, with this method is that we can pull out those keys from the hash to the method definition using Ruby keyword arguments. This way we can, 
just look at the method and see what it, what it needs exactly. So it's like a, we, we have this nice um, uh, signature, right? And of, but of course, the hash we are passing is bigger, so we need to swallow the rest of the, the keys we are passing. Uh, without that, this code will not, will not run. And we can just name it like this so no one, can, so no one will be tempted to use it, right? And then when we convert all our calculations to those, to those modules, we can easily test them in, in perfect isolation. We just pass in some keys, get the results. It's really it's super testable. And we can arrange them for every bank into a, into a pipeline, right? We can just put them in a row and say, this is our algorithm, right? And we're going to use a hash for that, where each value of each key represents the, uh, our, our module. Well, at this point, we know that there is no such thing as one algorithm to, to rule them all, right? We know that we need to actually create different pipelines for, for every bank, which is, difference, which is a difference to our previous design, but you know, now we know it, so. But that's not really a problem because we have a very granular code reuse. We can really mix and match those, uh, those functions as we please. If, you know, if we see there's the same one, for, for many banks, we just, use this, we just use this one, and it's really very granular. So each bank will have this evaluation pipeline method with, with, the, with, with ordered list of calculations, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to take our data, and we're going to pass it from one calculation to another, and we're going to add the result of the calculation to the data and pass it along. And this way, every calculation on the road has all the data with all the inputs and all the calculations that were previously, right? Okay, so let's wire this thing together. We have our skull calculator, but we're going to rename it to evaluate because we don't like the previous name anymore. And we are doing much more than just score calculation. We are actually evaluating all of the values. And we're going to use the same pattern with a static method, which takes our input data hash and our bank. Uh, first thing we're going to do, we're going to merge those hashes, the bank parameters and input data, because it's data, right? Doesn't matter. And then we're going to take out our pipe. And for each of the key value, it's a hash. So for each of the key value pairs in this hash, we're going to Call the, call the module with the data, create a new key value pair, and assign it to the data. So, so the next iteration of the each loop can reuse uh, enlarge hash. By accident, we are getting uh, immutability here because merge is actually creating a new instance of the hash. It's not mutating the hash. And one thing we can notice is that actually we can make this each loop even shorter with the reduce, where data is our accumulator. So, so this is it. The output data looks like this after the, whole, after the whole traversal of the pipeline. And we run it for every bank. And we have the, we have, at the end, we have the output data holding all our values. We can persist them. We can... Uh, you know, redo the, the same calculation in the future. We, we don't, we're not losing any data here. So the final, the final solution we arrived at is, uh, is simple, it's extensible, the code is composable and has, has clear boundaries, and it's, it reveals its intent much, much clearer, much better than the previous design, right? It's, uh, it's not a silver bullet, of course. It has, you know, we had to make some trade-offs. Um, we, have those, we have those keys on, on, on the hash, which we kind of have to keep consistent. But we've been using solution based on this uh, in production for, for more than a year. It didn't have any bigger issues with that. Adding a bank now to the system is, is a pleasant task, really fast. And we successfully introduced new developers to the project. And I can sleep at night. So what are some lessons learned here? Well, obviously, this example 
scratches the surface of, of what functional paradigm offers. At the same time, though, I think that it actually touches the, the core of functional programming, right? It's about, it's about stateless, composable functions, transformations operating on immutable data structures. There is a division between behavior and data, and this offers some great possibilities, and it's a powerful, powerful tool to have in your toolbox. And I'm not saying this changed me to functional programmer. I'm still doing mostly OO programming, but it did influence how I write my code, how I write my Rails code, too. I'm, I'm really doing lots of small focused service objects, which, uh, which are just simple data transformations. And in the end, it's all in, Rub it's all in Ruby, right? You don't have to, you don't have to change your favorite language to learn this stuff. So Ruby just turns out to be a great enabler. And that's it. <laughs>